The introduction of difference and repetition has one main goal, to show what happens when we approach repetition from the point of view of representation. And Deleuze concludes this first chapter with the observation that there is not one, but there are in fact two perspectives to be had on repetition. The first one describes repetition from the point of view of representation as a static definition. The other one is dynamic, it implies difference within repetition, making it a creative process of spatialization based on the idea with a capital I which, as we have seen, is a problematic instance, like a paradox. As Deleuze says, in the dynamic order, there is no representative concept, nor any figure represented in a pre-existing space. There is an idea, and a pure dynamism which creates a corresponding space. The relation between these two definitions is complex, and it is one of the main topics of difference and repetition. Of note is that Deleuze does not deny the representative definition, he does not condemn it as false, he does not say there is no objective reality, for example, but that would already be an objective statement. Rather, he treats it as one moment in the process of thought, which is as such a genetic process. The structure of the introduction reveals this genesis as far as repetition is concerned. How representation fails, and how we are to overturn it. The difficulty being that this overturning must be more than a representation, it must be a movement. Roughly put, the general movement of this first chapter is this. Following a number of steps that we're going to examine in some detail, Deleuze produces a representation of the concept of repetition, in which difference and repetition are distinguished. This prompts him to rethink the relation between repetition and difference as a genetic process. Deleuze begins his inquiry with a negation namely the observation that repetition is not generality, and in fact opposes it in three different ways, from the point of view of conduct, of the law, and of the concept. By conduct, he means our treatment of the relation between the abstract and the concrete. In the classical dialectic of the one and the many, the one is said to supersede the many, one essence to rule many appearances. In this framework, I behave as if any particular thing can be exchanged or substituted by another, equivalent one, without this changing the abstract concept. I can take any cat as an example of the abstract idea or essence of cat, such that this essence is set to be distributed in every cat instance. But, Deleuze explains, repetition as a conduct and as a point of view concerns non-exchangeable and non-substitutable singularities, and he replaces the classical notion of the particular, or the many, with that of singularity. To repeat is to behave in a certain manner, but in relation to something unique or singular, which has no equal or equivalent. Secondly, from the point of view of the law, law, he explains, determines only the resemblance of the subjects ruled by it along with their equivalence to terms which it designates. Far from grounding repetition, law shows, rather, how repetition would remain impossible for pure subjects of law, particulars, since, as we have just seen, repetition is really about singularities not the many relating to abstract unity. There are two types of laws, the laws of nature and the laws of morality. The laws of nature are always determined in relation to fixed terms, particulars which can be exchanged. Scientific experimentation, for instance, merely substitutes an order of generality for another, namely an order of equality for an order of resemblance. Thus, generality only represents and presupposes a hypothetical repetition, given the same circumstances, then. This does not mean that Deleuze denies science. On the contrary, it means understanding its particular power. Similarly, moral law understood as the implementation of good habits also presupposes repetition. But again, this is not, Deleuze argues, a real repetition. He explains that there are two ways to overturn moral law, either by denying the foundations of a law through the use of irony, mocking its axioms, or through the reductio ad absurdum, by which we show the absurd consequences of a law. Thus, he says, repetition belongs to humor and irony, rather than the seriousness of the thinker. So, he says, if repetition is possible, it is due to miracle rather than to law. It is against the law, against the similar form and the equivalent content of law. If repetition can be found, even in nature, it is in the name of a power which affirms itself against the law, which works underneath the law, perhaps superior to laws. If repetition exists, it expresses at once a singularity opposed to the general, a universality opposed to the particular, a distinctive opposed to the ordinary, an instantaneity opposed to variation, and an eternity opposed to permanence. In every respect, repetition is a transgression. Here Deleuze takes the example of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and shows how they put metaphysics in notion by making of repetition something new, something against abstraction in the form of laws. 
In all their work, he says, movement is at issue. Their objection to Hegel is that he does not go beyond false movement. In other words, the abstract logical movement of mediation. They want to put metaphysics in motion, in action, and presumably so does Deleuze. Against the law, humor, irony, and movement. The goal consists in substituting direct signs for immediate representations, of inventing vibrations, rotations, whirlings, gravitations, dances, or leaps, which directly touch the mind. It is in a theater in which we experience pure forces, dynamic lines in space, which act without intermediary upon the spirit and link it directly with nature and history. All of this is similar to what Deleuze calls echoes, doubles, and souls, the secret vibration which animates repetition. The lexical field which surrounds real repetition is both joyous and kinetic. Thirdly, repetition is opposed to generality from the point of view of the concept or representation. This is a little bit more technical. Let's begin with the definition. What do we call representation? Deleuze says, the relation of a concept to its object under this double aspect in the form that it assumes in this memory and this self-consciousness is called representation. Following the principles of vulgarized Leibnizianism, this provides a theory of conceptual difference or representation as mediation. But this mediation has as a character that it becomes blocked, or more exactly, it blocks itself. That is, it interrupts the idea with a capital I, it produces fixed images and concepts, and it freezes the movement of the spirit. There are two general types of blockages described here, logical and natural, and of the latter, there are three forms. Let us begin with the logical blockage. Concepts are usually defined by two things, their extension and their comprehension, which is sometimes called, also, intention. Roughly put, the extension of a concept, idea or image consists in the things to which it applies and its comprehension, or intention, in the idea's properties or corresponding signs that it contains. In the formal sense, an idea, like cat, applies to any cat who ever lived, all those currently living, and all those that will exist. By contrast, the comprehension of the idea of cat may include things like animal, locomotion, perception, etc., etc. So you could say that extension is external to the concept and deals mostly with quantities. Meanwhile, intention is internal and deals with qualities. Of course, there are exceptions in every case, but the important point is this. Comprehension and extension have an inverse relation, meaning that the more internal qualities an idea has, the less objects it will refer to in the real world. Similarly, the more references an object has, the less comprehension it'll have. So if I add fur to my comprehension of the idea of cat, I will have to exclude from this extension all cats that do not have fur. Inversely, if I want to include them, I will have to suppress fur from its comprehension, which increases its extension. But problems arise as soon as I limit the comprehension of the concept logically. I am then forced to accept that it designates by right an infinite number of objects, and as such it can define absolutely no currently existing thing. Every logical limitation of the comprehension of a concept endows it with an extension greater than one, meaning that it designates more than one object. In principle infinite, and thus of a generality such that no existing individual can correspond to it, he could nunc, here and now. This is how formal identification of the logical concept blocks itself. It becomes a kind of ghost. The second case is said to be natural rather than logical, because here our ideas are not artificially extended. They correspond rather to a real or empirical experience. But even in nature, ideas will be blocked. And there are three cases of natural blockage, which follow a progression. In the first case, a concept with finite comprehension passes into existence without any increase in its comprehension. For example, the Epicurean concept of Adam, which has a meager comprehension, as Deleuze says. Similarly with words, which are like the atoms of language. While their repetition in existence is real, meaning that atoms have a discrete extension, I can nonetheless doubt the existence of the Epicurean atom itself, and I can only define a word with other words. This phenomenon of discrete extension implies a natural blockage of the concept, different in kind from a logical blockage. It forms a true repetition in existence rather than an order of resemblance in thought. So atoms and words block the idea because their reality is nominal, they exist in name only. Their repetition in the real world depends on the meagerness of their comprehension. But regardless of this situation, this provides us with a first understanding of what repetition really is or must be. Repetition is the pure fact of a concept with finite comprehension being forced to pass as such into existence. The interesting fact about atoms and words is that they express a certain power of thought, they manifest a certain creation. 
Atoms as physical entities, words as linguistic production, both appear to produce more of themselves in our real experience, even if they are only nominal. The second case is that of natural concepts. These concepts have an indefinite comprehension, meaning that I can always add a character to a concept without limiting its extension. The paradigmatic example here is Kant's paradox of symmetrical objects. Let's say that I want to define my right hand. I can say five fingers, bones, flesh in a certain configuration, articulations, this length, etc. But no matter how far I go in the specification, there will always remain an ambiguity between this particular object, my right hand, and at least one other object in the universe which corresponds to this definition just as well and which is my left hand. Because no matter what, it will always have the same comprehension as my right hand. The difference between them is exterior to them, as it relates to an external or transcendental order of spatial orientation. And of course, this is not true only for hands, but for any non-symmetrical object. Well, we can't just stand here staring at our hands. Although... Wow! So Deleuze explains that with Kant, a crucial step towards the understanding of real repetition is taken, as the thing has found the means to define itself. But still, the transcendental approach does not give a fully real repetition. If such concepts can be repeated indefinitely, it is because nature is both partes extra partes, meaning that in space objects are immediately distinguished by their position, and also mens momentanea, meaning that such concepts have no memory. They are only partially real repetitions because the mind only extracts novel from what it contemplates. It extracts the concept from nature. It is in this context that Deleuze formulates the representative definition of repetition. Repetition thus appears as difference without a concept, repetition which escapes indefinitely continued conceptual difference. Such concepts are called concepts of nature. Their characteristic is that they are always in something else. They are not in nature, but in the mind which contemplates it or observes it and represents it to itself. That is why it is said that nature is alienated mind or alienated concept, opposed to itself. Finally, in the third kind of blockage, we have an individual notion with an infinite comprehension, endowed with memory, but lacking self-consciousness. The problem when self-consciousness is lacking is that repetition is like a reflex. It is still a repetition of the same rather than a real repetition. When the consciousness of knowledge or the working through of memory is missing, the knowledge in itself is only the repetition of its object. It is played, that is to say repeated, enacted, instead of being known. It is as if I was repeating a word without having a conscience of what it means. Repetition here appears as the unconscious of the free concept, of knowledge or of memory, the unconscious of representation. Examples of this could be the Freudian slips, or perhaps the concept of freedom itself, which can only be repeated but only produced as a negation, such as the absence of constraints. We can imagine many other examples. Maybe it just learned to talk as a parlor trick, like Fry. Like Fry. Like Fry. This is why, discussing Freud's concept of repression, Deleuze says, I do not repeat because I repress. I repress because I repeat. But we can nonetheless extract from this case another trait of real repetition, namely that repetition is fundamentally about the future. Self-consciousness in recognition appears as the faculty of the future, or the function of the future, the function of the new. The main takeaway from this part is that individuation is engaged in a repetition, which can be either inauthentic, that is, blocked artificially or naturally, or authentic, in which case representation and repetition merge, and yet remain distinct, like concept and action. In general, the practical problem consists in this. This unknown knowledge must be represented as bathing the whole scene, impregnating all the elements of the play and comprising in itself all the powers of mind and nature. But at the same time, the hero cannot represent it to himself. On the contrary, he must enact it, play it and repeat it until the acute moment that Aristotle called recognition. At this point, repetition and representation confront one another and merge without, however, confusing their two levels the one reflecting itself in and being sustained by the other, the knowledge as it is represented on stage, and as repeated by the actor, then being recognized as the same. So I am never outside of the process of repetition. To speak about repetition itself is already a repetition kind of play. But the key lies in producing something new, when the presented and the represented confront and merge without becoming the same. The remainder of the introduction discusses a few examples relating to nominal concepts, concepts of nature and concepts of freedom. 
it does not yet reveal what real repetition is, for we will need to discuss difference first in order to understand it. However, it prepares the way by distinguishing the two perspectives on repetition, which in turn reveals a fundamental asymmetry at the heart of the genetic process, one which is bound to explain the productive nature of repetition, and this leads to a famous theme, the mask, which expresses it. The two definitions of repetition are opposed term by term, as presented here. Importantly, this double perspective is arrived at by breaking down the notion of causality. This reveals that difference and repetition do not entertain a simple relation of causation, but rather one implicates the other. This relation of implication means that while static repetition is distinct from dynamic repetition, the reverse is not the case. This is presumably because of the nature of immanent causality. The effect of an immanent cause is not outside of it, as in normal causation, but within it, comprised as a part of it. As Deleuze says in a later chapter, the individual distinguishes itself from the ground, but the ground does not distinguish itself from the individual. And it would be why Deleuze explains in the preface that all identities are produced as an optical effect by the more profound game of difference and repetition. That is to say, while differentiation occurs in the depth, it adds layers on the surface where representable optical effects are produced a little bit like a crystal growing on its surface. Unfortunately, we cannot discuss the many examples provided by Deleuze in the remainder of this chapter, as that would make for an extremely long video, but they all appear to go in this direction. Let us consider just one, extracted from this quote. In a network of double squares, we discover radiating lines which have the center of a pentagon or a pentagram as their asymmetrical pole. The network is like a fabric stretched upon a surface, but the outline, the principal rhythm of that framework, is almost always a theme independent of the network. Such elements of dissymmetry serve as both genetic principle and principle of reflection for symmetrical figures. The static repetition in the network of double squares thus refers back to a dynamic repetition formed by a pentagon and the decreasing series of pentagrams which may naturally inscribed therein. Following the author mentioned by Deleuze in this quote, this means the following. If we take double squares separated by a golden ratio rectangle, we obtain the basis for the construction of the pentagon, which is described by this author as an important principle in architecture and sacred geometry. The point is that the symmetrical network occurs on the basis of the dissymmetrical rhythm as a special case of it, even if in practice we proceed the other way around. This is why Deleuze says, the repetition of dissymmetry is hidden within symmetrical ensembles or effects. The two repetitions are not independent. One is the singular subject, the interiority and the heart of the other, the depths of the other. So the problem of asymmetry expresses the productive process, as we will see in our study of chapter 5. All of these themes we will encounter again, but let's just consider one last figure, that of the mask, which is of extreme importance as far as repetition is concerned, as it is, in fact, Deleuze says, its secret everywhere the other in the repetition of the same. This is the secret, the most profound repetition. It alone provides the principle of the other one, the reason for the blockage of concepts. In this domain, as in Sartor Resartus, meaning tailor retailed, it is the masked, the disguised or the costumed, which turns out to be the truth of the uncovered. That is to say that whatever we find at the heart of repetition, it is already veiled in a certain form due to the nature of our cognition. In the wonderful reversal, Lewis explains that the masked is more profound than the naked. The mask is the true subject of repetition. Because repetition differs in kind from representation, the repeated cannot be represented, rather it must always be signified, masked by what signifies it, itself masking what it signifies. All of this prepares us to discuss difference, which is the topic of the next chapter. However, and this will be the conclusion of this video, we can already see the first glimpses of the idea with a capital I that Deleuze is developing in difference and repetition, its fundamental paradox. Namely, we know that we cannot represent difference. But how then are we to understand it? How can we communicate it? Well, only through the many masks in which it presents itself. In light of what we have seen above, we know that we can find it in one of two repetitions. We cannot repeat the unrepeatable, but we can repeat singularities. We can create new concepts. We cannot observe difference from without, but we are always already a part of it. So in the next video, we will examine chapter 1, which is called Difference in Itself. For now, thank you for watching, and see you soon.